Good afternoon, everyone. Allison Skaberg here with Consolidated Planning Group. I'm happy to be here uh, with you, and we are also partnering with Next Steps Transition um, today. Uh, they couldn't be here, um, but we're they're here with us in spirit today. So today, um, I always like to talk about a, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we are in webinar mode today, and that means that we can't see you or hear you, but we know you're out there and we're glad you're here. Um, I invite you to put your questions in the chat box as we're going through the presentation today. I'm gonna get to as many questions as I can uh, during the time of this meeting. Uh, we're going for an hour today, so if you're planning uh, your day, you can plan on that. Um, all of our webinars are recorded. Everyone that has registered for today's webinar is going to get a copy of today's slides with all of the links and websites, so you do not have to take notes on everything you see in here. You're going to get a copy of it, so that way you can use that as a reference guide. Um, and also, you will get a link to the recording. Um, all of our past recordings live on the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to for free. There are over 400 webinars on planning for special needs if you can think of a topic it is definitely out there and we have labeled them in such a manner that you can search um, for the topic that you're interested in and in your planning journey and kind of where you need to go from here um, so today what we're talking about are um, educational options beyond high school um, and some of the things that you may keep in mind as you're planning for your loved one with a disability. So a little bit more about Consolidated Planning Group. I always share a little bit more about who we are and what we do. Um, we are nationally certified as Social Security Advisors, members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. So we are uh, an advisory and consulting firm partnering with families just like yours who have a loved one with the with a disability we help people plan for the not only their own future but the future of their loved one for when you're gone or no longer able to um, you know provide the caregiving services that you once did um, we help people uh, put lifetime protection plans in place lifetime care plans we do a lot of transition planning we help set up able accounts and we do a lot of advocacy through the way of our webinars and so when it comes to planning for special needs we suggest that you absolutely work with a specialist and that is for your legal um your your legal documents such as guardianship special needs trust wills um, all of the legal documents that's the legal side that is not what we do there's always often a lot of confusion of what do we do and what does an estate planning attorney do? And I always simplify that by saying that they're the paper, the legal documents, you absolutely need them. And we are not a fan of do-it-yourself legal documents, not when it comes to special needs. Um, and we're the money. So we're, how much do I need to fund a special needs trust? How do I make sure that I have money in the right buckets to protect eligibility for state and federally funded programs? So those are some of the things that we do. Um, so whenever, you know, we start thinking about, you know, planning for the future of a loved one with a disability and we're thinking post high school options, you know, we know that a lot of our kids, um, you know, may stay in, in the public high school to age 21 or 22, they might be in a private program or a, um, a, a type of a transition program and that's um, all okay. So I think when we start thinking about higher education, I think about having, you know, realistic expectations. Um, you know, is it a traditional path or a non-traditional path? And we always talk about they are where they are. They're not behind. They just are where they are. So meeting them where they are, um, maybe it looks like they go to higher education at 18. Maybe it's 22. Maybe they're behind from a maturity level and maybe they go to higher education at 30 and it doesn't matter is the point that I want to say. There are a lot of doors that you can walk through when it comes um, to taking these steps. Um, a lot of you are aware of the transition programs. A lot of your kids may be already in some of the transition programs. We've got trade school, community college, university degree programs. There's also university certificate programs and licenses. Um, we should think about a reduced course load. Does your student have the the um, wherewithal to handle a full 
caseload of 12 hours. The Social Security Administration says that our kids with a disability, a full caseload is eight hours. But there's nothing wrong with taking one three hour credit course um, and kind of, you know, dipping our, our, our toe in. Because what we want to do is have some um, little successes along the way. And if we throw them into the deep end and they don't have success, then, and then they're not really willing to try again because they feel like they failed. So think about going slowly, moving slowly, instead of just dumping, jumping into the deep end if they're not ready for that. Um, you know, thinking about living at home versus living on campus, there are a lot of programs and we're going to talk about those. Um, partnership with other organizations to live on campus. These are paid for services that are out of pocket to the family if it's in line with um, a work um, a work plan through the Texas Workforce um, Commission VR, it may be paid for through that. That's something to consider. Sometimes um, it, it would be good for our kids to go to work um, for a little while and get some life experience under their belt and working on a team and things like that. And so VR can definitely help with that. We have entire presentations on VR, how to get connected with um, with vocational rehab. And I always just like to mention them because a lot of times people don't know about them. VR um, is services for an individual with a disability who has an impediment to employment. Services can start as early as age 14. Services are paid for through the VR program who is state and federally funded and they have to use those funds. So it's a really good program. They'll do a lot of assessments and testing to see what those gaps and impediments to employment actually are for your loved one. And then they'll put some training and resources in place um, to help close those gaps. Um, they have various programs, um, the, the workforce solutions, you may have heard of Summer Earn and Learn, you may have heard of pre-employment training services, but these services start as early as age 14. So if you don't know about that, mark that down to learn a little bit more about that. Um, so a career path and ideal work settings, there's a lot of tests out there and they're short, they're, you know, it's not this long drawn out test where um, you can check it's basically gonna it's a kind of a personality test and it and then it and, and the vocational test that will say based off of the answers of that test what um, your student may thrive in what kind of profession they <clears throat> may thrive in <clears throat> and what type of professions to look for so that's something there's a lot of those tests online that are free a lot of the community colleges um, also offer those tests, but you can look for those. So those are things that are good to look at. And then also be aware of um, the Department of Lab Labor and registered apprenticeships. There are a lot of registered apprenticeships for individuals with, uh, with a disability where they can um, work alongside a professional and learn a trade. They might be getting paid while they're at it. Um, Project search is another program. So if the the your student is um, is still in higher um, excuse me and still in high school, um, project search is something that is worth considering. We've had a lot of families that have had success with project search, and um, you know we've had um, students with disabilities placed at Dupont and other big organizations and hospitals. Um, and they were part of Project Search, but which was later they were hired on as full time employees with benefits and 401k and what have you. So, but those programs are for um, students that are still still in high school. But just be aware of that as well. Okay, so there are six strict six traits that we need uh, to succeed that our students need to succeed and this is where i'm talking about meeting them where they are i know that we as parents we have um, high expectations for our kids and we're looking around and we're facebook parents and we see all the wonderful things that other families are doing put your blinders on for that it doesn't matter what everybody else's kids are doing it's what your kids are doing so we think about the six traits that students need to succeed um, at higher education. So number one is self-awareness. The Goldberg study found that successful participants showed awareness of their strengths and weaknesses in both academic and non-academic non settings. Um, the student is proactive. They have the ability to per persevere in challenges. Um, they can do some goal setting and maybe they need some help with this, but some goal setting. Um, they're aware and um, able to use effective support 
systems, and then they have some emotional coping strategies. And so I think that the, the truth is now some of our kids are not behind from a maturity um, perspective, but a lot of our kids are. And so just because if you're looking at them right now and they're 18 or they're 16 and they're not there yet, maybe they're 22 and they're not there yet, they're getting there. Um, you know, it's a, just a reminder that our kids' brains, a neurotypical brain is not even fully formed until they're 26. And when we have kids that um, maybe two to four or even more uh, years behind their peers, it's okay that we're still getting where we're going. So if they're in, you know, I think that there's nothing wrong with staying in the public high school. If they're thriving and they're doing well and they're learning and they're growing and they're learning some life skills and they have, um, they have friends and they have community, you know, we have a lifetime of, um, of uh, providing care for our loved one with a disability. And so if those few more years in the school or in a transition program gives them some of the the confidence and the maturity that they need to be successful at higher education, call that a win. So accommodations, I always want to talk about accommodations because a lot of our kids truly, truly need accommodations. They've had accommodations in the public school, maybe in the private school, maybe they were in a homeschool setting, so they had ultimate accommodations for their needs. Um, accommodations aren't always the same at higher education. Just because you had an IEP or a 504 in the public school doesn't mean that it transfers to higher education. So one of the things that I found frustrating as a parent when we were kind of going down this highway with with my child with a disability is that all of the schools do things differently when it comes to um, the accommodations, how you apply for accommodations, what is required to get the accommodations. So be thinking about what accommodations does your student need. Some of the accommodations that we need um, that we needed that, you know, rendered, rendered us successful at higher education was um, voice to text recognition software. This might be appropriate for people um, that have processing speed delays, maybe they're slower and moving, um, maybe they have fine motor skill issues. Um, that may be something. Um, another thing was audio books. Again, with um, somebody that has processing speed delays, obviously any hearing issues, any vision issues, um, some of the audio books and other things like that may, may be relevant. Um, extra time, extra time to complete uh, testing. Um, it could be as much as 100% more time, 50% more time. Again, if they've got processing speed delays, working memory issues, these are all things that might be helpful. Um, another one might be testing in a testing center in a non-distracted area, as opposed to a class with 50 or 100 people in it. So those are some examples of the accommodations. So what I would say is when I was looking for higher education for my student, the first thing that I looked at was the, the degree path or the certificate path, whatever it is that you're looking for, what schools have that path, okay? So that's the first thing. So we're gonna narrow schools down that way. Then the second way that I narrowed down schools was doing my homework on the Office of Disability. If your child needs accommodations, the Office of Disability at the Higher Education Institution matters. Some of them are wonderful and some of them are not. And we literally checked schools off the list because their Office of Disability was lacking. Um, because we know what we need, and we know what we need to be successful, we know what accommodations that we need, and they can either provide that or they can't. And if they can't, they were off the list. And I'm not saying that you have to do that, but that was the way that we worked it, because there's so many endless options. The other thing that I wanna talk to you about is SAT and ACT those exams. So when do you need this? When do you not need this? And again, all schools are different. Schools got a little bit more relaxed on the ACT and the SAT after COVID. They're probably gearing that back up. Every school is different on what they require for SAT and ACT. Community colleges do not require an SAT or an ACT. So if you know uh, that your child is going to a community college or that they are going to a license and certificate program, they don't need the SAT or ACT. And a lot of our kids test poorly. A lot of our kids have severe test anxiety. So my point is, is that they're going through that door. Why even put them through the stress? Sometimes people say, well, I just want them to 
learn this and feel this and even if they do poorly it's an experience and we're growing and that's not wrong either um but let's talk about the act and the sat so if they are going to be taking act and the sat you should know that you can get accommodations for testing for for, for those exams and you're going to go straight out to their website um, and you're going to type in the search bar once you're on their website accommodations or disability accommodations and it's going to take you to the page um, on what you have to do to apply for accommodations you absolutely do have to apply it does have to be signed off on by a doctor and my recommendation on that is apply early so if you're scheduled to take the exam in april um, it's it's too late it, it's probably too late I don't want to be a naysayer but usually they move pretty slow um, they did get better they did improve um, so it's it's much faster than it was before but it doesn't happen in 24 hours or 48 hours so know what the timeline is and get that stuff in there so you can get the accommodations what we're trying I'm not trying to talk too much about accommodations but I think about my student who has graduated college um, and many, many disabilities, but graduated successfully on time. And the reason behind it was because we had the accommodations in place from day one. Um, and those accommodations allowed her to um, to thrive and do what she needed to do. What we don't want to do is start a semester and be two or three weeks into a semester and not have those accommodations in place. So you're going to want to check those requirements and be prepared and remember that all schools are different on their requirements. Um, most schools are re requesting updated testing. What kind of testing am I talking about? Learning, um, learning disability testing, neuropsych testing, maybe some of the testing that the, the public school has done. You may have had private testing. There may have been testing that you had done through VR because your student is already in VR. They usually want that testing to be updated every three to five years. Um, there are some exceptions to that, and it's worth it to ask if they will process an exception. And here's an example of an exception. Your student has a disability. They've had it since birth or they've had it since they were a toddler, and the disability doesn't change. It basically is what it is. It's really never changed. It's the same. And sometimes they'll take outdated testing along with a letter from your doctor, psychologist, psychiatrist, pediatrician basically saying that the condition hasn't changed and here are the deficits that the student has as a result of the condition and here are the um, accommodations that I am recommending. These are the same accommodations that I've recommended from the beginning. I've definitely seen universities and community colleges accept that. So it's worth asking. And the reason I say that is because the testing is expensive. If you're paying for this out of pocket, your health insurance um, typically doesn't cover it and it's going to cost you anywhere from 1500 probably upwards of $3,000. Um, it is testing that is um, often done um, through VR and they pay for that so just keep that in mind. Um, so the other thing that I want you to know about is um, having a power of attorney and a FERPA. Um, a FERPA is a federal law and this is a, um, your student has to sign this to get um, information on their behalf and it's everything and I've heard it all all the time parents are frustrated what you let me pay for this, but I can't get any information. Yes, that's right. It's a federal law. So the FERPA is a form that you can download from the school's website and your student can sign it. If your student is under a full guardianship you need to check with each of the schools that you're interested in on whether or not they admit students that are under a guardianship so that's something to know and the power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney is something that we recommend um, for your students with disabilities if they're not under guardianship but it is also something that we strongly recommend for your students um, that are neurotypical um, this is just something that's good to have in place especially if students are traveling back and forth to colleges that may be in another town mental health crisis there's a number of reasons that you want to have this in place um, and I, I think of the mental health crisis and if you don't have that health care power of attorney power of attorney in place and your student has a mental health crisis at a, at a university and they haul them off to a mental health hospital they won't even tell you where they took them 
<laughs> so it's a big deal. Hopefully that never happens. But those power of attorney and healthcare power of attorneys are an important document. And while you're at it, while you're looking at your neurotypical kids and whoever else, don't forget your aging parents. It's important to have those documents in place. Oftentimes they have not updated their documents. And so my point is, is don't wait for the crisis to happen. Don't wait for something major to happen and realize, oh, snap, we do not have that in place. OK, so. When it comes to accommodations, reasonable accommodation is required if it does not pose undue hardship. This is for housing. This is for dorms. This is for apartments. This is for jobs. And you can read more about that on Ask Jan and also the Department of Labor as well. So, um, you know, some of the accommodations that you may think of, like uh, one accommodation that we had, you know, depends on what the health um, concerns are of your student, but maybe they don't need a roommate. Maybe the colleges require a roommate. You're planning on them living on campus, but maybe they have all kinds of other equipment or other things like that that may be distracting or frustrating to a roommate. They may be able to get um, a uh, you know, a room without a roommate, whether that's a good thing or not. I mean, some of our kids don't want to interact with others and being, you know, interacting with others is helpful. Another thing that um, a person might be able to get in for as far as housing dorms and um, apartments, um, you know, is like a first floor, floor apartment. If a person has gait or mobility issues or they're, you know, unsteady on their feet or other things like that, you might be able to get a first uh, floor apartment. You might be able to get an assigned handicap spot. Um, handicap um, pass parking passes may be um, a, a, a godsend on a campus. Campus in uh, campus parking is always an issue if you have a student that is driving. Okay, so here are some of the educational programs. Now, this is not an extensive list of everything that is out there. These are ones that we know that are out there um, and that they are worth looking into. We don't work for them. They don't work for us. We've got Alvin Community College Strive. This is a, um, a skilled training, uh, rewarding independence and vocational education. Um, there is Green Oaks Life Prep at Arlington Baptist University. We've got Austin Community College Steps Program. Um, the College Living Experience, we have another slide on that, so we'll talk about that. Dallas uh, College, El Centro Campus, the Moving On and Next Step Program. Dallas College, Richland Campus, Richardson ISD um, Transition. El Paso Community College, Project Hire, the Achieve program at Highline, um, Highline College, Kent, uh, Washington. We've got the VAST program from Houston Community College, Lamar University, um, they have a Disability Resource Center. They've got some good programs. Some of these are on here because they have a good Office of Disability. Some of them are off, on, on here because they specifically have programs. Um, for kids with intellectual disabilities, we've got Lee College Life Skills for Intellectually Disabled um, Students, Lone Star College in Montgomery, in Montgomery County, uh, Life Path. Um, we got Career and Tech uh, Education, CTE. Uh, Lone Star has a lot of different programs, so check them out. They are very much known for working well with individuals with disabilities. Lynn Universities in Florida, um, Boca Raton, they have a metamorphosis program. They have several programs out there. Um, Navarro College, the Elevate program. We have non Perel uh, Institute, which isn't college, but it is higher education. And this is going to be more on um, kind of uh, tech tech stuff, training in, in tech stuff. We've got pa um, Palo Alto College in San Antonio Project Access. We've got the PASS program at South Texas College. We've got Aggie Achieve, you may have heard of, the PATH program at AM. Um, and the TU CASA program at AM. So there's a lot of programs. Um, continuing on, Texas State has access and learning accommodations. We've got UNT WISE, UNT Elevar, UNT Engage, the Sooner Works program in um, um, Oklahoma, University of um, St. Thomas. We've had families complete there um, an associate in uh, applied science and pragmatic studies. And then um, we've even had students that have completed that that have gone on to higher education at St. Thomas from there. Um, the University of Texas at Austin, lifelong learning with friends. 
West Texas A&M and Canyon where the learning continues. So there's a lot of different programs out there. What I would say about these programs is think early, plan early, have your spreadsheet, know when these applications open up and when they close. Um, some of them don't have like endless enrollment. So you're gonna wanna apply to several of them um, and give yourself a choice um, of where you can go and which ones you get into because your first choice may you may not get into. Think College is a website. Um, it's the only directory of its kind. Um, it really has um, a lot of college and universities that offer post-secondary education programs with for students with intellectual disabilities. There's over 309 colleges out there. So check out Think College, okay? Another thing that I like to mention is Jody Glau. Um, she is someone that we have partnered with in the past. So if you wanna find a webinar from her, you can find that on our YouTube channel, Jody Glau. If you are just simply too busy, this is overwhelming, you know, and you would like to hire somebody um, to be an independent educational consultant um, for your student. She will do work directly with your student, with you. She is very knowledgeable of programs all across the United States. And we've had families that have hired her in the past and have been very, um, very pleased with her results. She keeps her ear to the ground. She knows what's going on out there. And she does a lot of listening about what your students' needs are and will be able to recommend recommend very specific programs that will be appropriate for your student and where they are in the learning process. So if you're wanting to hire somebody, um, she's your girl on that. Then, so we talked about briefly, and we did a webinar with them just a couple of weeks ago, the college living experience. Um, the college living experience, experience provides individual post-secondary guidance and instruction um, they they work on academics, career development, independent living skills, social development. This is a separate paid for program. Your student can live there. Um, it is uh, close to um, Blinn and um, and a and m is is basically where it's close to. Um, your students can go to the college living experience to prepare to go to the community college or go to higher education, but some families are interested in this. It is important to note that this is a standalone fee, the college living experience, in addition to any kind of tuition or whatever you're signing up for um, um, for your student for higher education as well. So from a cost perspective, it might be um, relatively expensive. So the Bloom Consulting, this is somebody else I always like to mention. <clears throat> Bloom Consulting, they're um, worth a trip to their website. They do a lot of things. They do vocational evaluations, private pay. Um, it may be covered. They are contracted with VR, so those vocational evaluations may be um, paid for through the VR program if your student's in VR. Um, but what I want to talk about is their Campus Connections Wraparound Program. This is a program that kind of goes alongside. You pay $1,000 a month for it. It could be covered by VR, um, but it's a wraparound program for your student with a disability that are attending um, a post-secondary institution of their choice. It doesn't matter what state. And they use the Berkman method assessment um, and they build an individualized support team and they pair a student with a connections coach who provides mentoring and guidance and navigational support. And I, what I like about this is they have some autonomy from the from the parent and they're working with other professionals and kind of closing the gaps on some of, some of those impediments. And the goal in mind is for them to be successful at higher education. So Bloom Consulting, again, you can hire them private pay. It also may be covered um, through VR if it's in line with the, the employment plan through v, the individualized employment plan through VR. So that's worth checking out. And again, worth checking out their website. So we talked about um, the, the workforce solutions. We need to update um, Anna Kluth on that contact. The phone number is probably still the same, but I think there's a new person in the role. But Texas Workforce uh, Solutions, Texas Workforce Commission, there's vocational rehab through the Workforce Commission. Workforce Solutions is going to be that summer earn and learn. It's going to be the pre-employment training services. 
Um, for our kids that are in high school, they have a student navigator, um, a, stu a student higher ability navigator. There are ways that they can get job coaching. Um, there are employers that specifically um, are known for working well with kids with disabilities and hire um, people with disabilities. So getting them involved in some of these programs are good. So this is just gonna really talk about here on this slide, the pre-employment training services and some of the different things. And what I would tell you um, is if you're hearing about VR or some of these um, you know, pre-employment training services or summer earn and learn programs for the first time, um, go to our YouTube channel and watch the entire webinar on these programs and how to get your child signed up. If your child is still in the public school and even a lot of the private high schools, um, there is a VR counselor assigned to your school so you can check with the guidance department um, and, and get, uh, get the contact information for the VR counselor that is assigned to your school. But if this is something that you're not involved with and you want to get involved with, I would tell you to do it like yesterday because it won't be long and school will be out. And you can still go online and, and click on Start My VR. You can put that in your search bar, Start My VR, and it's going to take you to the Texas Workforce Commission website where you can self-submit your student for VR. One little caveat that I want to tell you about this is that your student has to be willing, okay? So sometimes we have parents that really want their kids to do VR and the kid has no interest. Well, they won't take them. So if the kid has to have some skin in the game and has to be um, willing to participate with with VR okay so the next thing that I'd like to talk about and again I want to just invite you guys if you have any questions to put them in the chat box um, when we're thinking about college we also are thinking about funding I mean college isn't cheap that's for sure so we're going to talk a little bit more about funding and we've got a lot of links in here for various scholarships that you can research so we're going to talk a little bit more about that the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. The FAFSA is available October 1st each year for the following school year. So if you're planning on your student going to college in the fall, um, you know, the, the FAFSA is already open and you can, you can complete your FAFSA. You want to complete this each year, even if you think you'd make too much money. Most people tell us they make too much money. You want to do this anyway. A lot of the scholarships require the FAFSA to be completed to be considered for a scholarship. So although you might not qualify for financial aid, you may qualify for any number of scholarships. So that's going to be important. When we think of scholarships, we think of community-based, school-based, disability and disease-based, sport, music, band-based. So what I will tell you is there are, there are plenty of scholarships for our students with disabilities. My daughter went to college on a full ride scholarship and it's not because she's a genius and she had great SAT scores or anything like that. What we figured out early on is how to play the game. We realized we're not going to get any band or school or uh, band based sport based um, academic based scholarships. So what could we get maybe it's disability and disease based. Maybe it's volunteer based. So, you know, we were very, very active in having um, her volunteer. So we wanted to go after the scholarships that we could get and not worry about the ones that we couldn't. You want to research and know your deadlines early. I again, I found this very frustrating. I had to have a, a spreadsheet to keep it all straight. All of the scholarship applications date, dates are different. They open up and close differently. A lot of people think that over Christmas break, so if your you know, um, kid is going to school the following year, so say they're a senior, whatever the senior status they have, and they're going to college the following year, school starts in August or September, and you think you're going to do all these college, app, um, college scholarship applications in December over Christmas break. Well, newsflash, some of the greatest scholarships out there close by December 15th. So if you're planning on doing it on Christmas break, you may have already missed that boat. So plan early, know the, when they open and when they close. A lot of them are first come, first serve. Early bird gets the worm. There's a lot of scholarships out there that people don't even know about. And so applying for those, you may get those. Um, it, it's, it's, it's worth the effort. 
I would say choose wisely on the scholarships. I definitely chose wisely because what I found is when we were looking at scholarships for paying for 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 higher education for my student, what I found is a scholarship that is going to give you five hundred dollars. What is that going to do? Pay for one book or a scholarship that's going to pay twenty thousand dollars often had the same requirements and some of them were a lot, a lot of information and they needed an essay or other things like that. So I chose wisely and went after the bigger ones, not that the smaller ones don't count, um, but it, you only have so much time and so many hours in the day. I would be cautious about paying for scholarships. There's all kinds of scammy scholarship stuff on the internet. So I would be careful on paying for things um, I, we didn't pay for anything. And again, her entire education, everything, room and board, we ended up getting everything paid for. Okay, so if you're clever and if you make your list and you follow, you know, follow through and follow through on those deadlines, you'll be surprised what you can get. So a 529 college savings plan may be another place that we're going to pay for higher education. An ABLE account, 529A, ABLE, there's a 529C for college. Uh, an ABLE account, if it can be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability, you can pay for it out of an ABLE account and higher education counts. So you could definitely pay for transition programs, um, community college license, certificate programs, um, university programs, all out of an ABLE account. And again, I know I keep talking about vocational rehab, but if your child is in VR and it is in line with the individual employment plan for your student, vocational rehab often pays for higher education. So you can check on that as well. And that is, um, has been a big deal for a lot of families um, and how they can do that. So when it comes to ABLE accounts, so what's the deal with the ABLE account? Um, an ABLE account is under the tax code 529A, achieving a better life for an individual with a disability. Some of you may already have a 529C in place for your loved one with a disability. And a lot of questions that we get often are, can I convert that 529C to a 529A? And the answer is yes, but it's $18,000 a year that you can convert it. So if you have a student that may not go to college, um, you do want to convert that ABLE account, we can help that with, um, we can help you with converting that 529C to the ABLE account, because what that's going to do is open up flexibility of how the money can be used. If it's in a 529C, it's for higher education, and if they're not going to go to higher education, you're going to be taxed and penalized to take that money out of the 529C, or you can roll the money over to the 529A, you can pay for higher education should they go to higher education in the future without taxes or penalties, but you can also um, pay for a variety of other expenses if it can be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability, then you can pay for that out of an ABLE account. We've updated this for 2024. Um, the contribution limits for an ABLE account is $18,000 a year. If the individual is working, you can put up to 14580 of their gross income. So if they only made 5000 in gross income, you can only put an additional 5000 but it's 18000 This is subject to the gift tax exclusion. Each year it changes. 2024 is 18000 You may have heard 17000 for 2023, which was correct, but it did change. So the bottom line with the ABLE account is the ABLE account does not count against them for SSI and Medicaid purposes. Um, it the if as long as it the expense uh, is construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability, you can pay for it out of an able account without a penalty or taxes. There's tax free growth and in investments, and you can change those twice a year. It can be rolled over to other family members who are eligible beneficiaries. Should you not use it for that person, or if that person passes away, but there is currently a Medicaid payback on ABLE accounts. So a Medicaid payback on an ABLE account. So that means 
if the individual with a disability passes away, um, there could be a Medicaid payback. There's all kinds of legislation out there to get that Medicaid payback to go away, but it hasn't passed yet. So if you've heard it's passed, it hasn't, um, but it is on the chopping block and we hope, um, we're hopeful and optimistic that one day that will get rid of that Medicaid payback. But one of the things that I would say on that is that for the most part, so, in an ABLE account, you never want to have more than $100,000 in an ABLE account because if you have one penny more than $100,000 in an ABLE account, they're going to disqualify for Medicaid um, and SSI. And most people's kids that are getting Medicaid, Medicaid will have paid far more than what they would have ever got back on a Medicaid payback. Um, so that's one way to look at it. And the other way to look at it is a savings to spend account. Like we put money in because it doesn't count against them for SSI and Medicaid purposes, that $2,000 limit that we're always trying to keep them under. Um, but it's a savings to spend account. So you put the money in and when you need money, you just have that direct deposited into the account where their SSI goes. And you just want to spend the money that comes from the ABLE account, spend it within that calendar month, not um, not 30 days from the date that you get it, but by the month end. So if there's 28 days in February, you would want to spend it before the end of the, you don't want it to roll over to the first of the month is basically how that works. Um, some people will say, well, you know, what can I pay for out of an ABLE account? I've said it a couple of times. If it can be construed as achieving a better life um, for an individual with a disability, you can pay for it out of an ABLE account. Here's some, some exa examples, basic daily living expenses, food and shelter, legal expenses, assistive technology, maybe housing or rent, maybe it's transportation, Uber, getting them where they're going, higher education, the list goes on and on. You could even pay for a vacation for the individual with a disability. for. For, for them and one to two caregivers, and I always joke and say, don't get crazy, you can't take the whole family, okay, but one to two caregivers um, for the individual with a disability and one to two caregivers, you can even pay for that. So when it comes to keeping track of expenses, we have literally uh, never had anybody um, asked to produce what they spent the money on from the ABLE account, but we strongly suggest that you keep just a good list um, of what is going um, what is going out of the able account in case they do ask for you to produce that in the future. We had somebody that said that their um, screen froze um, and was wondering if anybody else had that issue. If, if you guys could just put that in the chat, it's looking okay on my end, so I hope it is on everybody else's. Um, so talking about scholarships, um, I like to just talk about scholarships. Um, there is the first one that I like to mention is that if you have adopted a child through the state, whatever state, if you're attending from out of state, um, the kids that are uh, adopted through the state adoption services go to college, go to state colleges for free. They don't go to private schools for free just yet. Um, but just be aware of that. Sometimes it was a long time ago that you guys um, adopted them and you forgot this. But just be aware that those kids go to school for free so that's kind of awesome um, we suggest asking for a list of scholarships from the child life specialist at any specialty clinic you go to for instance texas children's baylor college of medicine etc whoever you go to if you see neurology cardiology oncology whoever you see they have a child life specialist and oftentimes they have a um, list of scholarships that may be available to the patients that they serve so do check with that so there are pages and pages of scholarships here that are worth checking out and looking at as you're um, creating your spreadsheet of the scholarships that you are interested in applying for the Terry scholarship is near and dear to my heart because this is one of um, this is one of many scholarships that my my child ended up getting. We ended up getting more and ended up giving them back because the Terry scholarship basically paid for everything for my student. So this is the scholarship that I was talking about when we were researching and saying, okay, well we're not going to qualify for academic and we're not going to qualify for sports or music or band or any of these other scholarships that are out there what can we do this scholarship um, has been the single largest provider for private scholarships in texas this is for texas high school graduates only not out of state so if you're attending out of state this is not applicable to you um, 
And so, so basically, um, it really just is going to close the gap on the full cost of university education. Um, what this scholarship is based off of is leadership potential character, scholastic record, and financial need. They are really rewarding students that have really been out there and volunteering. And I'm talking more than just volunteering at your church. What have they given back to? What have they been involved with? I think my daughter had more than 800 service hours. Um, and so this is just something that is worth checking into. These are the colleges that are involved in the state of Texas. And back then it wasn't one application where you just do one application on the Terry Foundation website. Each school had their own application for the Terry Scholarship. So if your student is interested in each of these schools, they're increasing their odds of being selected for an interview for this scholarship. It is a big, big deal. And once they get it, they've got it for four years and it's not an impossibility to keep. Like some of these scholarships, I call them give and take away. They give it to you, but then you have to maintain a ridiculous GPA to keep it and then they take it away. Um, that is not how this works um, with uh, the Terry Foundation. So, um, so just check this out. This is one that is a big one. It's a big deal and it is a four year scholarship. So here's some additional scholarships. Again, we've got links to all of these. Um, if you can think of it, there's scholarships for siblings with kids with disabilities. Um, every basically every diagnosis out there has scholarships out there, so it's worth checking those out. And again, those are specific scholarships or specific disease related scholarships. So, you know, some of the masses may not be applying for some of those. So being aware of those and putting those on your list and making a decision on whether or not it's worth it or not worth it. You know, like I said, I, I think for us, we just had so many big ones that we were going after. The small ones, 250, 500, 300, just didn't seem worth it. Now, if their applications were super simple, then maybe yes, go after those. But a lot of times their applications were not super simple. They were just as difficult as the giant, giant scholarships. So I, you know, again, it's how much time do you have? Are you hiring somebody to do these applications for you? If, if you're doing them yourself, then I would say choose wisely. So pages and pages of scholarships out there. These are just ones that we've come across over the years. So we want to just mention those to you. Um, <clears throat> there are a few um, books that we want you to consider, consider and I know this, um, you know, has, has been updated updated the fist guide uh, to colleges is a great book to look at colleges that change lives this is also a great book um, a lot of these schools in here they may not have a specific um, program for an individual with a disability but they are known for working with individuals beautifully with disabilities and then there's also a learning disabilities book uh, as well so we suggest checking those out and you can get those um, you can get those on Amazon. So I think we had somebody that said that they missed page four of the scholarships. And um, just as a reminder, if, if you joined us late, everybody is going to get a copy of these slides um, with all of the links. So you do not have to write all of these down. You're going to get the slides so you can research to, uh, until your heart's desire here on that. So just wanted to go back on that. So as um, we are wrapping up for today, you know, we always talk about, you know, keeping things on your radar of what you need to do. And I know as a parent with an individual with a disability, it feels overwhelming half the time, whether you're dealing with health and human services and their erroneous cancellation of your child's Medicaid, or if you're dealing with the Social Security Administration or some ridiculous letter that you got in the mail, it's always something. It's always, always something. Um, and I know that firsthand, but there's a lot of things that as we're thinking um, about our students and our loved ones and transition, um, keeping things on our radar and next steps. And again, we really have webinars on all of these topics, how to develop a comprehensive special needs care plan, future care cost estimates, how much money do we need to fund a special needs trust, Medicaid waivers. And on the screen here, it says Texas um, waivers. Um, if you're joining us from out of state, we're glad you're here. There are Medicaid waivers in every state. Texas 
unfortunately has a long waiting list um, for services up to 17 years. Other states, some other states don't have a waiting list at all. Medicaid waivers are designed to waive off some of the cost of care for caring for an individual with a disability to keep them in home and community-based services. Some of these Medicaid waivers are paying for transition programs. They might be paying for attendant services or respite services. It's very important to educate yourself on these. Make sure you're on the list in Texas. There are such things as crisis diversion slots um, for waivers, and we have an entire webinar on that. SSI, SSDI, understanding the differences, knowing when to apply, that's going to be on our YouTube channel, the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel. We've got lots of information on SSI and SSDI because I know that is one of the biggest topics that causes the most confusion. There's a lot of acronyms that they throw around that sound the same, that are not the same. Sometimes they sound different, but they are the same. And it's very, very confusing. So if you have felt confused with this, you are not alone, but there is there is a lot of um, educational and resources out there on that YouTube channel for, for you. ABLE accounts, entire presentations on an ABLE account, how to open an ABLE account, we can help you with that. One thing that we didn't talk about today that's very, very important is beneficiary designations. When we're planning for our loved one with a disability, we always want uh, to preserve their eligibility for state and federally funded programs, even if they're not getting it right now. They may, you may make too much money, they may be under age 18 and they may not qualify for anything just yet, but that changes when they turn 18. So as far as beneficiaries are concerned, we do not want to name your loved one with a disability as a beneficiary on anything you have. This is life insurance, long-term care, bank accounts, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, annuities, pensions, 401ks, 403bs, the list goes on and on. Um, the right way to leave money to our loved one with a disability is by way of a third party special needs trust. So we talk about that a lot as well. We have entire webinars on guardianship and what you need to know about guardianship and the alternatives to guardianship, such as supported decision making agreements, partial guardianship, power of attorney, health care power of attorney. Um, we um, we also um, have webinars on um residential living communities we say start touring those what is your plan is your plan for your loved one to live outside of your home is your plan for your loved one to live with you for as long as you can take care of them um a lot of these residential places what you'll find what you'll find what i found when i toured them is they're awesome and that the residents there are very happy and that they love it there and they have autonomy um, from you. They have friends, they have community, they may have a job. Um, there's a lot of cool things that are happening in some of these places. Some of them take Medicaid waivers, some of them don't, some of them are private pay. Um, but the waiting list can be long and a lot of them require that you do a tour um, prior to getting on their waiting list. So what my suggestion is is start doing tours. Make a day of it. Go have lunch. Do the tour, get on the waiting list, give yourself the opportunity to say no, as opposed to needing to say yes and not being able to. Um, so those are some of the things that we, you know, we recommend. But one of the things that I also like to say is just, you know, be encouraged. And remember at the beginning, they are where they are. They are not behind. It is okay. It is okay if they go to higher education at 35. Maybe it's 18, maybe it's 22. And it's okay if they go and they fail and we do it again. How many times have you needed a do over in your life? I've needed do overs before in my life. Sometimes our students are going to need a do over, and sometimes it just has to do with their maturity or lack thereof, or what they can deal with, and you know what they can't. You know, depending on some of their their diagnoses. So, um, thinking of your path and taking these little steps, baby steps and building on success, letting them have success, letting them have a win, letting them do an apprenticeship or a um, paid work experience where they're actually getting paid and feeling good. Maybe they're not making much, but they're making something and they're feeling good about that. Um, and they're feeling good about their ability to interact with other people on a job or something like that. Think about the little wins and the little steps. Think about, do I wanna take a summer class? You know, they're all colleges have a um, have a course. It's basically university to higher education studies. Um, you know, 
it, it's, at, it's at that community college, it's at the higher education institutions, and it's basically a class, it's for credit, that teaches them how to be a good college student and what it's going to take to be successful um, with higher education. So that is an example of a class. And guys, there are a ton of non-credit classes that a student could take at the community college. Yes, you pay for them. But what if they took some non-credit classes at the community college to dip their toe in, have some success, build some confidence in their learning ability, and then start taking four credit classes. These are all things that you guys can keep on your radar. One thing that I forgot to mention that is important um, earlier when we were talking about testing, when we're going to higher education, whether it's the community college or the university, there's an entrance exam for these universities in Texas that's called the TSI, TSI, Texas Success initiative they're going to test reading writing and math you could pass math and fail reading you could pass reading and writing and fail math okay um, what they need to do is pass these to be able to take four credit classes in those subjects there are practice exams most of the community colleges have free practice exams for for the tsi um, and so you can get those for free i've done had my kids do free practice exams i've had the paid for ones personally think the paid for ones are better they're not that expensive so you can look online for the paid for tsi practice exams um, you can take it multiple times there's a small charge for taking it it has to be scheduled um, but so if your student hasn't taken the tsi the tsi is required you don't have to have the act or the sat to go into the community college you don't have to have the tsi to, to take non-credit classes but if you're going to be taking credit classes, you are going to have to take that entrance exam for reading, writing, and math. So just be aware of that and check on that. And it's okay to have them start practicing this in high school. If they're still in, in, in high school and you want them to have, you know, start practicing, you can hire a tutor, you can have people work with them on that. Um, do check that out as well. So in your slides, you're going to get a link to our upcoming webinars. We do webinars all the time. These webinars were really based off of my own frustration. As I mentioned, I have kids with disabilities. We've transitioned into adulthood and it's tough. It is tough. And I eat, sleep and breathe this. This is what I do every day. And I found it almost laughable of how hard everything was when we were transitioning. So a lot of our webinars are based off of my own frustration and my um, heart to put tools and resources in your hands so you feel empowered um, to take the steps that you need to for your student to be successful. So I hope you will find the YouTube channel, um, you know, a, a resource to you. Use it as a resource. Um, like I said, we've labeled them in such a manner that you can find um, webinars on the topic on their problem that you're having. It is out there. We work on a collaborative team here at CPG. Again, we're nationally certified as Social Security Advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. We stand ready to help you in your planning journey. So whether you're sitting here and you're saying, okay, gosh, I would be embarrassed for you to know what we haven't done, or you're saying, wow, we've done a lot of planning and I think we've got it all sewed up. Um, or we started and we put it on the shelf and we need to pick up back, you know, where we left off. We meet people where they are in their planning journey. So maybe you've got a lot of stuff done and you want a second opinion or a look under the hood um, from a team that is nuanced and working with families with special needs. That's us. We can help you. Whether you need to get started or you need to just pick up where you left off, we're ready to help you. And we always offer free personalized consultations. So this QR code, again, you guys are going to get an email um, with this slide. Um, you can hover your camera over the QR code. It will take you to a calendar link where you can book a free personalized consultation. I know that um, that a lot of people you know, may not want to put their big questions in the chat box for everybody to see or what have you, um, but you can certainly um, reach out for a free pers personalized consultation and we can learn uh, a little bit more about the planning that you've done. Even if it's nothing, it's okay. It's not about looking back. It's about looking forward and, and, and taking the steps that you need to take to be successful. Successful. The thing is, when it comes to planning for our loved one with a disability, they're probably going to live 25 to 35 years past us. When it comes to our own retirement, 
um, we're going to spend 25 to 35 uh, years in retirement. So careful planning really goes into play um, when we're planning for a loved one with a disability and how we're going to fund that special needs trust, who's going to care for them when we're gone, and how we're going to take care of those things. And we're here to help you navigate all of those things. It seems like a tall mountain and one that may be impossible to climb over, but we help people every single day with that. So just know, again, it's not about beating yourself up about what you haven't done. It's about looking forward and um, getting getting you where you need to be. So having said that, guys, I, I know that we're out of time uh, today. If you had an additional question that didn't get answered, feel free to email us. Um, you can reach us at 281-690-1177 um, or email us at contact at cpgcares.net. If you're listening to this on a podcast and you would like a copy of these slides, we are happy to provide that. So just email us at contact at cpgcares.net. Thanks everyone for joining us today. It's certainly been my pleasure and we look forward to meeting with you in the future. Take care. Bye now.